Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, Changing the Practice of Medicine with Artificial Intelligence. Um, I'm Don Elliman, and I have the honor, and I mean it's an honor, to be the Chancellor of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, and I'm delighted that I'm here, and I'm thrilled that you are, are all here. This program is part of our Transforming Healthcare series, which we started about eight years ago as a way to showcase really extraordinary talent and breakthrough achievements in science and in medicine. Uh, events like this allow us to highlight the work that we're doing on this campus and the relevance that it, that it has for each of you sitting here today. Um, in case you haven't noticed, we have entered the age of artificial intelligence. Just this past year, that technology took a giant leap forward. AI went mainstream. How do you spell chat GPT and everything that's followed? Um, big data biomedical informatics, machine learning, are opening the doors so wide that the possibilities are seemingly infinite, spanning in the, in the rest of the world everything from banking to cybersecurity to shopping to travel. It's exhilarating and frankly it's a little frightening at some times. Um, what does it all mean for health and medicine? How do we harness the undeniable momentum of these technological forces to better understand illness and disease, to better personalize care, and save and improve lives. That's what tonight is all about. We know these technologies will fundamentally reshape the healthcare landscape and the very practice of medicine. In many ways, they already are. On this campus, we are determined to be a leader in this field. We've gone big in expanding our talented team surrounding AI, some of whom you're going to hear from tonight, and we've invested in the resources needed to push their work forward. Among our key assets are a new Center for Health Artificial Intelligence, known here as CHI, a new Department of Bioinformatics, and the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, which we do in collaboration with UC Health. We are proud to have eminent scientists and leading researchers already here who will lead us in this effort. And I hope you find their work as insightful and as exciting as we do, and that you leave here tonight inspired by the possibilities. We wouldn't be here without the help of benefactors, some of whom are, of you of whom are sitting in this room. So for those of you who have helped us invest in this project, we are very, very grateful, and I can't tell you how important it has been uh, to our progress in this area. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, Dr. Casey Green, founding chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics, the director for the Center for Health AI, and the Marsico Chair for Excellence in Biomedical Information Technology. Casey's going to get us started. Come on up, Casey. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I have the privilege of, of getting us started and really setting the stage to talk about how um, we as a campus deliver insight to the point of care. Um, it's interesting, I've been working at the intersection of computer science and medicine for a while, and uh, so I asked ChatGPT to go ahead and create an image of what I look like. So create a whimsical, I have a five-year-old at home too. So create a whimsical children's drawing of someone who spends their day working at the intersection of the fields of computer science and medicine. So this is now me. Uh, but you know, one of the things that's um, kind of changed my job over the past, let's say, 18 months, um, is that I used to struggle to get people excited about the intersection of AI and medicine. And then as soon as ChatGPT came on the scene, like. You know, I went from the person no one wants to talk to at the Thanksgiving table to the person people won't stop talking to at the Thanksgiving table. And so that was really an interesting transformation. Um, and I think, you know, probably many of you are here because of the, the you know, the excitement that ChatGPT has created. But I think um, really a lot of my excitement comes from, yes, these technologies, which are absolutely transformative. Healthcare to make uh, better decisions. Um, and so, um, you know, I think a lot of the work under the hood has happened for quite some time. And so I'm really excited for the lineup of folks that you'll get to grill later in our question and answer period um, to, to understand how these tools are working. Um, in my case, you know, I have come to this from the intersection of uh, genetics, computer science, and informatics. 
Um, and so I'm going to give you a quick example of why it's really exciting to be working at the intersection of computer science and medicine right now. And I'm going to um, do that through some work that's happening in the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, which is a nation-leading center that's bringing genetics to the point of care. So we actually bring genetics to the point of care here more than anyone else does and more effectively than anyone else does, um, in large part through the work of this center. Um, so this is an example. So this is a patient story. This is an actual patient story, although the image is generated by Dolly, which I showed you earlier generating the image of a whimsical drawing. Um, so this is an example of a 58-year-old man who's receiving capsitabine for rectal cancer. Um, in this case, the, the person has severe nausea and vomiting. So the physician orders a, a drug. And in this case, the drug that they've ordered, Ondansetron, is actually not going to work for them. And in most cases, we would not know that that drug will not work for them. But the reason it won't work for them is because they have a genetic variant in a gene called CYP2D6 that makes them an ultra-rapid metabolizer. And so what that means is when we give them this drug, their body is going to break down that drug so quickly that it will have no effect. Because of the work that we have, because of the work that we do here at the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, um, we are actually able to have this information sitting in the electronic health record so that when the physician orders this drug, they get an alert. Uh, and that alert says, oh, this drug is not going to work for them, but we recommend this alternative therapy. In this case, they followed that alert. They proactively changed the patient to an alternative drug. And now they're tolerating their therapy with no toxicities. Um, and that's really important, right? Because if someone is receiving chemotherapy and they're having very severe toxicity, ideally we get them on one of these anti-nausea drugs, right? And we hope that works and then they can continue to tolerate their chemotherapy. But it's not like we all go through chemotherapy all the time and we don't know what's unusual, right? So we could go very far down the path and have a course of treatment that is suboptimal. So our ability to put the right information in front of the physician at exactly the right time to make the right decision for us, this leads to better care. And what you're going to hear tonight is how a lot of um, different efforts are happening on campus using AI to deliver exactly the same thing, this type of insight at the point of care. And we're, one of the ways that we excel at that is thinking about this from a very practical point of view. So when I moved here, you know, one of the things that really impressed me about Colorado is how practical we are. So the reason this type of testing is not routine uh, is because when you when a provider orders genetic testing, the specific type of testing that we're talking about is something called pharmacogenomic testing. It doesn't really matter uh, that that's the term, but what it basically means is we want to know if that person has a genetic variant which will cause a drug to work differently for them. Um, when a provider orders this type of testing, what they get back is a very long table, and then they have to look through that table and they have to figure out, okay, am I doing something that I shouldn't based on this? It's like a 90-page PDF. Not that many providers are going to look through that 90-page PDF to try to come to exactly the right decision. What we do here is we actually deliver that information through the electronic health record. So you'll hear from C.T. Lin uh, later, who, who thinks a lot about how to do this uh, well. And um, so in this case, if a, the provider was about to order, in this case, Plavix, which is an anticoagulant, which for some people does not have the desired effect, right? So it's supposed to prevent heart attacks and clots, but if it does not have the desired effect, that is a problem if we're giving that for that purpose. Um, in this case, this person is an intermediate metabolizer for this drug and may have an inadequate response. So when the physician orders that drug, if this person has this genetic variant, they get a recommendation, remove that drug, because it's not gonna work. Use this alternative instead. And if you give physicians the right information at exactly the right time and let them and, and pair that with the type of information they need to make the decision, that actually works. And so that's why uh, we really excel at this. Um, for the care pathway that I talked about before, we've implemented that as now standard of care in GI oncology. Um, and we did it in less than 12 months, which is um, quite quick for uh, anything in healthcare. The way it works, um, and this is a collaboration between CU and UC Health. Um, at, in our Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, um, when a patient is seen, uh, an additional order gets filed to take a blood draw. That comes actually up to the seventh floor here. That sample is genotyped. We return, the electronic, we return that information back to the electronic health record. Um, and then UC Health has built um, a way for us to put that back as discrete information that can then power clinical decision support. And so that means uh, if a provider does something that their genetics would, would contraindicate, they get an alert. 
if the provider just you know, does what the genetics indicate, it doesn't interrupt their workflow, right? And as long as these things work with provider workflows, providers use them. Um, we launched this uh, very quickly in less than 12 months. We've now had more than 100 patients with the tests ordered. Um, and we're actually seeing real outcomes in the clinic, like the one I told you about at the start. We also can do this at scale. So the, one of the other things we excel at, because we work so much in the electronic health record, is getting this in front of patients. So I told you one story. Um, but I would point out that you know, as of December 2023, there were 5,500 patients for whom we had a, kind of that type of story. Um, so 5,500 alerts have fired. Um, and this was as of January 24th. We'd returned about 240,000 results to the electronic health record, which we were proud of because it made us the largest such program in the country. Um, since then, we've returned another 100,000 results to the electronic health record. Like The way that we are scaling is very remarkable. And we've had another 1,000 patients with alerts just in the first three months of this year. So this is actually making a tangible difference in care here, and it's making more of a difference in care here than it does anywhere else. <laughs> Thank you. And at the end of the day, this is kind of our driving philosophy, and that's what you're going to hear, is that the standard of care is not standardized care. And that's one of the things that really drew me to see you when I moved here, is that there was this pervading philosophy across the institution that we can do better. Um, Okay, so we're here to talk about AI. What I've talked about is genetics. So let's get into AI. What is AI? Every time I, every time I talk, I get this question. Um, so AI, if we think this, of this big bubble, um, you know, one of the original definitions is that it's automated, human-like problem solving. This includes machine learning, but it also includes rule-based engines, things that existed kind of a long time uh, in the past. You know, you think about Deep Blue playing chess. Um, those types of systems would be included in AI, even though they're not necessarily kind of the next subcategory we're going to get into that people are excited about, which is machine learning. So machine learning are methods that are trained kind of directly from data. Um, me, you know, many of the predictors that you'll hear about um, tonight kind of fall into at least this class. Um, one of the examples that really caught people's attention about 10 years ago um, was the, a story that came out about how Target knows you're pregnant uh, before you tell anyone. Um, and that, that's based on kind of buying patterns. And, and so those algorithms all kind of fall into this class of machine learning. Within that, there's deep learning. So these are a set of machine learning methods that have become um, very widespread in the last, say, 10 to 15 years. Um, these are methods that actually can piece parts of a problem together and then use those partial solutions to solve a bigger problem. And these are extremely powerful methods to go kind of straight from data to very high quality predictors. Um, when you see um, uh, algorithms that you know, can predict what's in an image, for example, these are often deep learning algorithms. And then finally, there's generative AI, which are methods that are often based on deep learning that can synthesize entirely new content. So if you've seen ChatGPT, which will write a response to you, if you've seen uh, Dolly, which I know you've seen because I showed it to you earlier generating a picture of me, um, right? those types of algorithms are generative AI. So you're going to hear about these classes throughout, of methods throughout the night. Um, one of the things that's good to know about these methods is that they can develop, discover these subtle patterns. So this is an article about how AI can spot pneumonia better than a radiologist. But these have benefits and drawbacks. So um, while AI can spot pneumonia better than a radiologist, it really matters that you do it right. So you're going to hear about sort of how people do this right. In this case, um, what this uh, person found is that, yes, this is a very high-performing algorithm for spotting pneumonia. But it turns out it's mostly using this bar at the bottom of the radiograph, which is actually kind of associated with the scanner that was used to take the picture. So there's ways to do it right, and there's ways to do it poorly. And I think one of the things that has impressed me about the community here at CU is that because we are so practical, the emphasis is on building algorithms that work uh, in practice and in the clinic. And so I think that's, gonna, that's a key differentiator for us. And up front, it can be really hard to predict the mistakes that AI makes. <laughs> Uh, so this is a really popular uh, example now. Um, and it's one of those where you can see why it's tough, right? Like, there are some of these where I would, you know, be in danger of biting into that and realizing only later it was not a muffin. Um, <laughs> but this is why it's so important that we think about and approach these things carefully. Uh, at the end of the day, this is, this is a quote from one of my favorite papers. It's actually a 1989 sociology paper where they studied uh, Olympic swimmers and what differentiates swimmers at kind of all levels of competition. And they make the argument that um, to excel in, in the practice of swimming, 
which I think applies across many fields, but you know, their explicit research is in swimming. The differences that, make, that sort of drive success and excellence are not quantitative differences. It doesn't mean that someone swam 10% more laps than someone else. They are qualitative differences. It means that you approach the sport fundamentally differently. You approach training differently. You show up on time. You complete the training. You swim through the entire time. You know, you eat right, you exercise, you rest. Like all of these things are fundamental differences in how you approach the practice of the sport that drive differentiation. And I, you know, when I moved here, I moved here because I felt like CU did this differently. So just as a quick example, um, you know, you get what you reward. In any field, you get what you reward. And here, our promotion and tenure guidelines let us recognize real world impact in a way that I have not seen elsewhere. If you save lives, that can count, and that's not always true. And so I think we need to recognize that. So uh, I think we've got a great speaker lineup, you know, other than myself. I'm really excited about the folks you're going to hear from. Um, C.T. Lin, who's the CMIO uh, at UC Health and a School of Medicine professor. Jayashree Kalpathy Kramer, who's a professor of ophthalmology. Tal Bennett, who's a professor of biomedical informatics. And Matt DeCamp, uh, who's an associate professor in the Center for Bioethics. Um, you're going to hear a bunch of topics as we go through, and you're going to hear about a bunch of interesting cases, and you're going to realize as you listen that many of these raise major ethical challenges and questions. So that's why we've got Matt here, so store up all your questions, and then at the end, we'll let you grill him. <laughs> uh, so finally, uh, I'm often asked to talk about how data are the new oil, and one of the things I've been really excited to see in uh, the AI field is that people are finally pushing back on this. I, you know, data aren't oil. Oil has value when it's stored. Data don't have value when they're stored. They only have value when they drive action. And so I think one of the things that we excel at here is using data to drive action. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. C.T. Lin, who's going to talk about predictive AI and GPT in healthcare. Thanks. So this is uh, one of my slide uh, topic slides, or I could give it the other way, which is, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> and some of you may have recognized this from a movie quote from 2001, A Space Odyssey. And if you have not seen this movie from, what, 30 years ago, time to figure out what streaming service has it and go watch it. Because I'll tell you, as the AI and the spacecraft dealing with the human and having these moral issues, to have this quote come out is, I think, a perfect quote for our moment in time today. So how amazing that the director thought about this 30 years ago. All right, generative AI is the current fad, blah, blah, blah. You can't uh, turn over any uh, newspaper without reading it, and I'm going to show you a couple of headlines in a minute. I want to cover sepsis, bloodstream infection, and some, a project that we're doing in this space that, again, if you're reading about other organizations working on sepsis, you'll hear lots of news about how sepsis predictors don't work and how we ultimately figured out how to make it work here. And then also about chatbot reply, and we'll have some interesting cases to go through as we apply generative AI to the work of clinicians corresponding with patients electronically. Physician burnout is a national epidemic. Um, all of my colleagues tell me about this all the time. Um, and uh, if you know my colleagues, you'll know that they point to me, um, my role as chief medical information officer, the guy in charge of the electronic health record. There's the guy, that's the guy who ruined healthcare, right there. <laughs> right? Physician burnout has reached distressing levels. Um, America faces a shortage of primary care doctors. They're drowning in work. Pandemic pushes doctor to burnout to an all-time high of 63%. So it depends on what article you're reading. Between 40 and 60% of our colleagues are burned out. So uh, let's go on and talk about predicting sepsis and how hard it can be. Here's a case for those of you who are non-clinicians, and maybe this is pretty straightforward for those of you who are clinicians. A 47-year-old woman, multiple fractures from a car accident, Undetected by her uh, medical team, her heart rate and her breathing rate starts to rise, her blood pressure starts to fluctuate. Um, because there's so many data points, it's very difficult to spot these very subtle trends. And it's not until day five when the patient tells us, you know, I feel terrible. She spikes a fever of 102. When, uh, we draw a lactate blood test, which is an indicator of sepsis, and that lactate is high, that's a diagnosis of sepsis. We start the IV fluids to get her blood pressure supported, we get the blood cultures drawn, we start the antibiotics, 
And then by day seven, respiratory failure, she transfers to the ICU despite everything we do for her, put her on the ventilator, and a week later on maximum support, she has a cardiac arrest and dies. This is a pretty typical case of how hard it is to spot bloodstream infection in the hospital. You come in for something else, we're doing everything we can, we spot the, the symptoms as quick as we can, and the question is, can we do any better? Could we have detected sepsis earlier? So why does it matter? About every hour throughout the country, 50 people die from sepsis. This is not a small disease. Hospitalizations for sepsis have doubled in the last 10 years. We are not doing better at this. This is a very difficult disease to get at. So uh, we had a first trial. We had uh, a couple of, uh, we have a data scientist on our staff that helped us write a predictive algorithm, one of those machine learning algorithms that was Dr. Green referred to. And we built one of our own. We also used one from our electronic health record vendor partner, Epic. So we have several sepsis and deterioration algorithms because we have all the data from our EHR for a decade. We gave it three or four years of data from lots of patients, millions of patients, and we asked it to spot patterns for every patient that did develop sepsis and then come, us, come and tell us what that patterns are. And then we would run it. And um, as my daughter um, at the time who was a teenager says, dad, don't hurt your elbow. I'm like, excuse me, don't hurt your elbow. Don't hurt your elbow patting yourself on the back so hard. Because just because you did the math doesn't mean you're doing a good job making practical changes in care, right? And around the country, you've, you've seen other organizations publish their, their sepsis models. We have a 98% sensitivity and an 89% specificity. Yes, we have similar numbers. They look, sound pretty good on paper. When you go to apply them, what happens? We show the deterioration scores on our uh, hospital units and we passively show them color coding, and uh, you'll already see the beginning of a problem here, which is look how many patients have a positive potential sepsis risk score. Lots of them, right? And if you have clinicians, oh, and, and we, here's another movie, right? The quote is build it and they will come. Everyone's gonna be like, yay, that's amazing, I love it. But does it work? And the question, and the answer is no, it doesn't work. Why are they not effective at the bedside? It's because our nurses and clinicians look like this. Constant alerts, right? If you've ever been in a hospital recently, you know everything's going off. Beep, beep, beep. Oh, no, no, no. And everything's got an alert sound, and pretty soon you tune all of it out because there's just too much noise that's coming at you, like, hey, pay attention to this, hey, pay attention to that. And as you might imagine, these clinicians and nurses, we are running as fast as I can with patients who are sick right now. You want me to think about patients who might be sick in 8 to 12 hours? Really? No, I don't have time for that. And what's worse is when you show me these alerts, what's the signal to noise ratio? How many alerts are you going to show me before I find a real one? And the problem is, uh, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. So our, our first trial, as we turned this on, was that we had no change in the number of sepsis cases, no change in ICU transfers or mortality. We didn't speed up time to IV fluids or blood cultures or antibiotics. And the blowback is, we're too busy, right? Why are you showing this to us? Because we get 61 alerts per floor. So 25 beds or so, there's 61 alerts on your patients. Let's go look at one. So if you imagine, uh, you check all these out and within the course of a day, you get one or two true positives, right? And that's because of our leadership decision. Our leadership decision said, don't miss any cases. You know, you do your math, but don't miss any cases. That's your number one directive. Well, those of you who are statisticians or mathematicians will know if your sensitivity is dialed up that high that you don't miss any cases, your specificity is not going to be great, meaning you're going to have false positives to look at. And we got what we asked for because, yes, out of those 61, we caught every single potential deterioration case. But if you can imagine 30 to 1 signal to noise ratio, if as a bedside clinician, you're, you're trying to help patients, beep, 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 come and look at it. I'm like, is this a case? You study it for a while and go, no, that's not a case. Well, maybe the next one. Nope, not that one. No, no, that's one. Well, after about four or five of these, you go, this is bunk, not helping me. I'm never going to look again. And CT and the mathematicians, are like, but, but if you look at 30 of them, you're going to find one. Seriously, where are you going to find them all? No, that's not going to work out for us. So that's the reason that that didn't work out well. We ended up designing a different process. So. Part of innovation means not only do you have technology improvement, but then you have to think about how you take that and use it as part of your team, 
right? Just because you have a tool doesn't mean, or how, how does it go? Um, a, a little boy with a hammer finds that there, there are nails everywhere, right? And so, and, and so it's not the right way to do is just shove everything at the bedside clinician. You have to take things apart. So in addition to the bedside team, we added the virtual health center, which is an offsite facility where we have critical care doctors and critical care nurses um, who have the time and who are not distracted by thousands of beeping machines. And we put eight, I think it's up to eight, widescreen monitors in front of them. It's like a command center. And then you have a, a connection to the bedside nurse, bedside clinician. And you can spend the time to comb through it and go, I think that's a real one. Pick up the phone and talk to the bedside person. And that's what allowed us, by taking those teamwork items apart, doing their workflow in a different way, this ended up changing the game for us. So in our second trial, our time to antibiotics dropped by 49 minutes, time to fluids dropped by 77 minutes. And if you look at the mortality curve for sepsis, we know that the sooner you respond from the time you diagnose, I think this is sepsis, to the time you intervene means that we went from, even before our first uh, AI trial, 210 minutes, about three hours from the time we go, I think this is something right, and you fax something down to them, you know, in the old days you would fax things down and then the, the pharmacy would like, oh, well, when someone's free, we'll, we'll mix up some antibiotic or send some IVs up for you. And that time we got down to 94 minutes and then with this we got down to 45 minutes and the most recent data is we're down to about 30 minute response time. And that's because we have a dedicated team ready to respond to these alerts in a very different way. And by doing so, um, we, we think we've constructed what we call the centaur, not a human horse, but a human and algorithm partnership, which is what's, I think, required to make these sorts of things work. What we're getting is uh, we're finding now we have a team that monitors all 14 of our hospitals, 1,800 beds, 35% reduction in code blue, you know, CPR cases, and a 20% reduction in transfers to the ICU, dramatic, substantial changes because we're able to take the workflow apart. So the difference between good and great ends up being, from a mortality statistic, 800 more lives saved from deterioration and sepsis per year. You see in this diagram, AI, machine learning, deep learning, generative AI. So I'm going to switch topics from sepsis deterioration to chat GPT. Again, physician team burnout's a national epidemic. 40% of doctors are thinking of leaving medicine in the next three years. 29% vacancy rate for nurses nationwide. And boy, we pat ourselves on the back because we're only at about a 25% nurse vacancy rate here. Ooh, way, way above the, way better than the national stats, right? Um, patient online messages increased 350% since 2020. Again, CT Lynn ruining healthcare, you're welcome. Um, uh, both great and terrible that our incoming volume for patient messages, patients sending messages to their clinician through the patient portal was before the pandemic in early 2020, 53,000 messages per month. And during the pandemic, as their clinics shut down and you can't really get in to see your doc, we saw that spike up to 183,000 messages per month. And that number has sustained since then. Our patients have found a new channel to communicate with us, which is both great, we love engaged patients, and terrible because this is net new work that's not reimbursed. This is Dolly drawing a doctor dealing with a hyper object that's slightly horrifying. So how about that? The typical primary care doctor receives about 20 to 40 online messages from patients per day. And this is not reimbursed work. So if you end up seeing a full day of patients at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you go home, guess what? Every night you've got 20 to 40 more messages to tackle. Right? On top of that, so this is pajama time. And the idea is, could we have AI write a draft reply to patients? And how would that be? So we turned this on about six months ago, and here's some examples that we're seeing. Um, we show this to not only our physicians, but to the nurses and medical assistants who work with our teams. And here's a nice example. Um, I'll let you read that. And the reply. And you could look at that and say, that's pretty reasonable. I don't have to fix a word of that. The AI wrote that whole thing. I would have said something similar. I'll just hit send. So there are times when, without any intervention whatsoever, you look at the draft. And by the way, let's be clear, this is not a closed loop, right? When you send a message, you're not getting an automated reply from a chatbot. You're having it shown to a clinician, either a medical assistant or a nurse or a doctor. And they're reading it. And they go, I like it. I'll use it. Or I like some of it. I'll fix a few sentences and I'll send it, or I'll say, you know what, it's terrible, I'll start my own. 
So these are all options for our clinician, but nothing goes back to the patient without some, some human having a look at it, some clinician, and doing that. And you notice that we do this, that we have um, automatically generated and then edited by so that we're transparent to our patients that we are using AI in our tools. You can't believe how many weeks of argument we did over, over the wording of exactly how we would say this. Here's another example for you. Good enough. I, I don't need to make a change here. Hit send, and then I go and hit the refills on these two prescriptions, and that's much less typing for the clinician, as you might imagine. Now, we do run into some difficulty. Here's a whoops. Should I get the new RSV vaccine? And the AI will say, no, there's no such thing as an RSV vaccine, right? However, there's this other thing. And we had to actually teach it because the AI was stopped training from the internet in 2021 before the advent of the new RSV vaccine. And we actually had to change the prompt by saying, hey, if you get a question about the RSV vaccine, say exactly the following. You know, the RSV vaccine is approved by the CDC for all patients over 60. I agree with this. You can go get it at your pharmacy. And so by teaching it little pieces of things that it doesn't get right, we can patch it and get it to a point where it's better. Here's another one. Um, thank you so much for all this help. I wanted to send something to the, bag to the office next week. Bagels, coffee, I don't know. What'd you Tell me what you would enjoy. What do you think the thing said? I'm glad it all worked out. As for sending some to the office, we truly appreciate your kind gesture. However, due to our office policies, we don't have office policies, by the way, we are unable to accept gifts. Your gratitude and satisfaction with our services is more than enough for us. Like, I don't think I would be that gracious. <laughs> How interesting. So, I, you know, we have these hilarious responses and our teams are having a great fun sort of listening and reading and going, wow, look at, look at what I wrote there. Sometimes it's terrible and we delete it and sometimes we laugh at it and we go, what? it makes us sound really good. Um, and one of the challenges we actually had was some of our clinicians saying, I don't use the AI response. It's too polite. <laughs> it's too long-winded. It's too polite. The patient's going to know it doesn't sound like me. I don't write like that. And so we actually had to take some words out. We started with, please be polite, friendly, and, and concise. And now we just say, please be concise. <laughs> so at this point, we have it in nine clinics, uh, 250 users, uh, two pulmonary clinics, a rheumatology clinic. Um, we're having fun with it. Uh, we have ongoing prompt engineering about being too polite or RSV and so forth, about 15%. But you would think, well, Gee, is it worth it? Well, only 15% of our responses, um, and, and it's getting better, and we plan to expand it gradually. You, you might think that, well, why can't I cap tackle all of it? Well, your patients will ask the darndest things, like, um, given my extensive 10-year history with you, what do you think about the interpretation of this CAT scan result compared with this other thing? Here, I'll paste in the result I got from across town. What do you think? There's no chance that the AI is going to do a good job with that sort of complexity of question. And so clinicians will say, fine, you know, uh, the AI gives up and basically says, it's important to come in for an appointment so we can discuss this in person. But uh, so there are, there are ways that we, we need to continue to innovate uh, on this further. All right. Um, hopefully, uh, and if you're interested in topics like this, I, you know, I love reading outside of healthcare. There's lots of innovation happening outside of the four walls of, of our hospital, our health system, and, and indeed healthcare. These are some of the books that, you know, if you want to take a picture of that, um, Tegmark and, you know, A Whole New Mind, talking about right brain thinking with Daniel Pink, uh, and then drive and motivation of clinicians. If the grunt work of taking care of a computer is no longer the primary work. What's, what, where are we going in terms of what is clinicians' work? What are professionals' work in healthcare and elsewhere? And how are we going to reassemble our teams in a way to take care of, to take advantage of the new team member that we have that we don't really know what it's going to be great at in the next few weeks and next few months? So other than that, thank you very much. Um, this is a link to my blog if you're interested, and uh, uh, I write about topics like this all the time. And then I'm going to hand this off then to Dr. Uh, 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 Kalpathy Kramer. Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about images. Uh, this is the, uh, so I'm in the Department of Ophthalmology. A lot of the work we do has been in imaging AI for many years. 
as uh, Dr. Green mentioned. Some of us have been very, very excited about what AI can do a lot before the last year when ChatGPT sort of changed the, completely changed the conversation around AI. Uh, the full disclosure, I used AI to help me with my presentation. I use it for a lot of different things. It, it is surprisingly good at uh, being a good brainstormer, you can ask it questions, it can ask, have a follow-up conversation, it gives you ideas. Um, if you want to teach a class, it gives you suggestions for what topics to consider. Uh, in this particular case, it was my scribe. It, it would listen to me because I had a uh, broken thumb at one point. It would hear me, it would translate my, uh, my accent, it had no problems with it. Uh, ChatGPT was, was great. Uh, there's a a program called Canva, which is like PowerPoint with AI, so you can just give it a few prompts and it'll actually create your whole slides deck for you. Uh, Dali has been mentioned many times. So that it's everywhere, right? We, we, we cannot escape AI. Whatever we do today, every day, it's all around us. Uh, the, the minute you're opening, you're unlocking your phone, it knows your face. Uh, it, it knows you, knows everything about you, for better or for worse. Uh, and it, your, it, it completely changes the way that you uh, interact with your surroundings. So the question, this technology has been developed outside of medicine. Lots of things are happening in photography, in art, in music, uh, in writing. The question is how do we take those same technologies that are developed there and start to apply them to the things we do in healthcare? Uh, one of the questions, again, why now? We've been trying to get people excited about this for 10 years. What's different now? We've, so very simple examples of trying to train image recognition algorithms for looking at CTs or um, MRIs. They didn't work really that well a few years ago. We've, we tried, we made all these sort of rules. They just didn't work as well as they do today. A lot of things have changed to come. It's a really great time now. Uh, many different things have come together. Uh, the, the community around AI development has been phenomenal. It's an open, open community. Very few of us who are in this field actually start from writing from scratch. We build on the things that other people have built on. It's an open community. You can go, uh, go to these frameworks. You can start there. We have high school kids who can come to a lab and work on this, and they can train an algorithm because it's a lot of this is out there and very accessible and open. Uh, one, one thing we need for AI is data. And as we get more and more digital everything, there's lots and more, more data. And in order to train really good algorithms, you need lots of data. And NIH and other institutions and other organizations have made it so public data sets are available. And then the hardware, this is a huge part of it, right? We need these really powerful computers in order to be able to do these computations. So all of these things have sort of come together at this time right here, right now, uh, and we are sort of enjoying the benefits of that. So I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes to see, sort of walk you through what we do when we are training an algorithm. As a sort of synthetic toy example, say we wanted to train an algorithm to uh, separate cats from dogs. So. I asked uh, um, Dolly to generate hundreds and thousands of synthetic pictures of cats and dogs, and you can see the pictures up there. We have a network, and as Dr. Green mentioned, a difference now is that we don't write, necessarily write the rules, we don't create a rule-based system. We just point the, the, the machine, essentially, to cases of cats and cat, uh, cases of dogs, and it, over time, it gets better and better, and finally, you have a trained algorithm that can, given a new picture, can say, is it a cat or a dog? A and in a sense, we're not defining what makes something a cat. We're not saying this is why it's a cat, this is why it's a dog. We just say thousands and millions of examples of this case and that case, and now it knows what, it's do what the difference is. One of the challenges, of course, with these systems is they're le quite a bit of a black box. So we don't really know what they're doing or how they learn these things. We just know that they do them extraordinarily well. Now that you have this trained algorithm, you can give it a bunch of images and say, oh, what is it? And it'll say, okay, that's a cat, that's a cat, that's a cat, that's a dog. And, and it'll do a good job of sort of sorting them into, <laughs> into cats and dogs. Unfortunately, it has not seen a human before. And so if you, all it has seen is cats and dogs, so it knows how to do a really good job with that. You give it a picture of a, of a human and it'll say, hmm, that looks like a cat. And so, <laughs> 
So, uh, so it, it, there's definitely limitations. And this is one of the big limitations, is that they do really well at uh, working in the settings that they've been trained on, and they don't do really well on sort of outside of what they've been trained on. So if all of they've seen is cats and dogs, they'll do great at that. But if they've not seen humans or something else, they, that doesn't work. Uh, for those of you who like to take pictures like I do, but don't like to organize them, the tools have become really good. As you take more and more pictures, your, your photo app trans, uh, sort of uh, puts people together. So for instance, it, it, it'll say, this is this person, this is that person. And what it does really well, though, is say, is this also the same person? And this is an example with my son. So it started off with today. And I said I'd label these pictures as him. Uh, and then it walked back and said, OK, is this also him? And then it went all the way back from today to when he was like 10. So along it, just by the sort of process of asking, is it the same person, it really learned what my son looked from today to a while ago. So these algorithms and systems get a lot better with experience. And uh, again, that's true for whether you're talking about uh, healthcare algorithms or your photos. So in, in my world, in medical imaging, we see that it's being used sort of throughout the workflow, from the time the patient comes in to how best to take the image, uh, how to reconstruct the image, how to get a better diagnosis, how to see if they're responding. Throughout the workflow, we're seeing AI being used. So here's some work we are doing with the National Cancer Institute in cervical cancer screening. So it's a leading cause of uh, cancer mortality and mor morbidity worldwide. The, with the uh, vaccine for uh, HPV, uh, we're definitely seeing a decrease in the um, mortality associated with cervical cancer, but it's still for many parts of the country and the world that where um, th that's not has not been taken up as much. It's still an issue. So uh, the HPV uh, infection is a primary driving uh, cause for most cervical cancer, uh, and the way this is detected in many parts of the world is sort of visually uh, inspecting the cervix after application of acetic acid. Uh, and what we are hoping to do is develop an AI algorithm in order to um, better diagnose cervical cancer. One thing we notice is substantial uh, disparities in mortality, especially across the globe. We see parts where it's really not a big issue uh, and other parts of the world where it's a huge issue. So this is a moonshot in, uh, initiative again with the NCI. The, it's a three-phased uh, approach. Uh, type, uh, step one is self-sampled HPV testing. So the first thing the, uh, the woman does is get a uh, self-sampled uh, swab and saying if they're HPV positive or negative. If they are positive, they do uh, further typing. Uh, and then the, uh, there's a picture taken of the cervix with the same sort of camera that you take of cats and dogs. And it's the same algorithm that trains your uh, cats and dogs can be used for uh, saying, OK, this is a uh, abnormal cervix, this is a normal cervix. And then the, uh, immediately, that, uh, as appropriate treatment can happen. So this whole process of developing and training this algorithm is really very similar to what we did with cats and dogs. Right? It's just, you need lots and lots of data. You need somebody to say this is a positive case, whether it's using biopsies to determine that. Somebody to say this is positive, this is negative. We train the algorithm. It may not work the first time. We add more data. We sort of learn what's, why, what causes failures. We improve the algorithm, and it sort of goes on. And the, the goal is eventually is to sort of deploy that in the, in the real world. So right now, we are in uh, nine countries in South America, in Africa, and Asia. Uh, and the algorithm has been developed, seems to be working well. So in the next year or two, we'll know how well it actually works in the field. There's a huge gap between developing something and publishing a paper on it and actually getting it, uh, as uh, Dr. Green mentioned, to work in the real world. The second area I was going to touch upon briefly is uh, this disease called retinopathy of prematurity. It's a disease that affects uh, low birth weight babies who are born uh, very low birth weight or uh, prematurely. And uh, it's a leading cause of preventable blindness worldwide. So the, the, the stats are uh, there. And the good thing about it is if it's diagnosed early, there's plenty of treatment options. The, the way that they, it's diagnosed by looking at pictures of the back of the eye. So if you look at the vessels, as the disease progresses, the vessels get squigglier. And the goal of this is to develop an algorithm that can do the diagnosis of this. 
the uh, advantages of AI is that there's a lot of variability in uh, the way uh, people have been doing it in the past is you have somebody actually looking at the images uh, and essentially saying uh, uh, where the disease is or how it is, and it was all on paper. There's a lot of difference in variabilities. If you ask multiple clinicians to look at the same images, you get different answers. And so what we hope with a lot of AI is to Im improve the standardization across clinicians. Uh, these are extremely... Uh, tiny babies, extremely fragile, If you, it's a very stressful exam. So if you can actually use AI to say this baby is not as much at, as risk, they can reduce the frequency ex of the exams, that can be quite, uh, quite important. And then there's many parts of the world where the access to uh, pediatric ophthalmologists is not there, and so again, we are hoping that we can make a difference there. So working with uh, the, the current director of the National Eye Institute and many others, we took Essentially, uh, many experts, we have them look at these images and they said which is uh, positive and negative. We trained the algorithm, we saw that it worked really well. Uh, we went, went through the FDA, got it sort of, it's going through that process now. And so I think it is something that can actually make a huge impact in real life. So we've seen a lot of the hope and the hype around AI, uh, and we've heard about it and about the, your next appointment with the AI, how it's going to. Uh, there's a, the eye is a great, really uh, great opportunity for uh, these algorithms. They're, the images are, have all kinds of information, and there's been work from our group and many others saying that many, many eye diseases can be detected looking at these, uh, these images. But what is surprising and amazing is not only eye diseases, but all kinds of information about your health. It can tell you if you're at risk of cardiovascular disease. It can, you're taking a picture of your eye, the algorithm can tell you if you're male or female, how old you are, whether you smoke, what, what risk of cardiovascular diseases you have, what risk of uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, just the, the range of possibilities is absolutely enormous. And there's this, this new uh, sort of field of oculomics where the, where the goal is to use the eye as a window to your, your brain, your health, your heart, everything. So again, this was some other work uh, from, from colleagues in the UK. They looked at the eye and were able to detect just about everything. So essentially what we are doing here uh, is sort of expanding on this. We have a wonderful retrospective database of eye images. We have all kinds of information about the patient. And we've seen that people can tell all, sort of identify all kinds of risks of diseases today, but also risks of diseases in the future. And, and this is not something humans can do today. Right? You give an ophthalmologist a picture of an eye and say, is it male or female? They cannot do that. How old is this person? Maybe. If they have hypertension, maybe they can tell. But what is the risk of getting Parkinson's in five years? That, that's no way the humans can do that now. And, and so it's absolutely wonderful, but the implications in terms of ethical uh, considerations, in terms of all kinds of things, and I let uh, our final speaker sort of walk us through the uh, through that aspect of it. But I if the algorithm can do something that humans cannot do, how do humans check it? What does it mean when we deploy it? What does it mean? Do you want to know that you're going to get some disease? Um, how good does it have to be before you want to know that information? So, very exciting time, lots of potential, but a and a lot of work happening here to make sort of take this from a lab to actually uh, affecting patient care, but a great time to be here. So with that, I'll uh, pass it off to our next speaker, Dr. Bennett. Thanks. All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about work that's been done with a cl in collaboration with a task force of people from all over the world, and I'm going to tell you why that's important. Um, but there were people representing 12 different countries and six different continents on this task force. Um, sepsis, it turns out, is also a problem in kids. I'm a pediatric ICU doc in my clinical life. 
Um, and um, the concepts of sensitivity and specificity that Dr. Lin mentioned are also important. Um, before you can predict sepsis, you actually have to be able to diagnose it well. Um, and that's a harder problem than it sounds like. And so the task, this task force was um, stood up in order to figure out how to do this better. And we needed to do this better so that we could save lives. We needed to do this better that in order for the kids who do survive sepsis to have better outcomes, to have better quality of life. And so that's really why this um, was such an important problem. There's something like 25 million cases of sepsis around the world every year. Something like 3 million kids die from sepsis every year. Um, and in fact, the burden of sepsis falls heaviest on kids in low resource environments uh, around the world. That's why it was so important that that task force involved people from all over the world so we could build this definition, these criteria, so that they would function in places where they didn't have access to all the things that we have across the street here. So um, these long-term impacts on the survivors of sepsis are well described, um, and they can include all sorts of stuff, impact on the families, impact on the kids. Um, so it's, it's, we really needed to do this well. Um, so the current pediatric criteria until a couple of months ago didn't work well uh, for kids for a couple of different reasons. They were designed in 2005, um, so they were not data-driven, um, so they were eminence-based. Uh, a bunch of people got in a room, actually only about 30 people got in a room and decided what they were going to be. They performed okay in some environments and, and then poorly in others. Um, and so by this definition, a lot of kids who didn't have sepsis got the diagnosis, and after a while, people kind of said, you know, this really isn't helpful to us doesn't help us make good decisions. And so in 2016, the adults got a better definition. It was data-driven, um, but it was very explicitly for adults only. Um, and in fact, it was uh, designed using data only from high-resource countries. So for a couple of different reasons, it wouldn't work for what we needed to do. Um, and so this task force took um, five or six years because this was a, a really hard problem. Also, there was a pandemic in the middle, um, as you might recall. And then in January 2024, we released the new criteria. I'm going to tell you how we, we, we put it together. So one of the things that that adult group did really well was come up with this conceptual framework. Um, so uh, sepsis is an infection with life-threatening organ dysfunction. There's no single test, there's no single blood test or anything like that that you can do. So you have to come up with a concept and then identify things that go with that concept. And so um, this, this idea that it's an infection and life-threatening organ dysfunction, anybody can get their head around that, and it worked really well. The way we broke that down, um, so infection, we know when, when people are getting evaluated for a suspected or proven infection at the right time, at the beginning of a, a healthcare encounter. Um, we know that something is life-threatening by using a, a target, a training target um, for these machine learning models of in-hospital mortality. And then we took a bunch of these existing organ dysfunction scores and we broke them into pieces and found the best ones. Um, and so, um, really importantly, we uh, were able to collaborate with sites all over the world to get data for this project. So there were six sites at higher, uh, six higher resource sites. There were four lower resource sites from Bangladesh, Colombia, China, and Kenya. I'm not aware of any other studies that I've ever read that included data from all those four countries. So we're really proud of that. Um, this included more than three and a half million pediatric hospital encounters across the entire spectrum of places where kids get health care, emergency departments, inpatient floors, intensive care units where I work. Um, it included an adequate age distribution. So um, sepsis, unfortunately, falls really heavily on young kids, and we had to make sure that we had enough data from young, really young kids um, to get this right for them. Um, it was quite a diverse data set, and that was really important um, for the people on whom sepsis, um, for the kids uh, on whom the, the burden of sepsis falls most, most heavily. Um, so in that first step, we took these, these organ dysfunction scores that existed. It doesn't matter what's in them. It's labs and vital signs and things like that. We broke them into pieces, and we used machine learning to identify the best ones. So we found the all-stars. And we took those all-stars and we again used machine learning. Uh, represented here by some math and some computers, to put together a couple of different sepsis models. Um, and here's where that collaboration with that international task force became really important. So two models were best. One of them had eight organ systems, so you're going to have to measure a bunch more labs and uh, you know, measure a bunch of different other things at the bedside. And one of them only had four. And so the people in Africa, the people in Asia said, you know, we really need to limit the number of things that the amount of work that a clinician, clinician has to do to make this diagnosis. And so because they were equivalently accurate, we took the machine learning model with only four organ systems in it forward. 
We then use another computational technique to take that fancy math model and turn it into one number between zero and 13. Integer, whole number. Somebody can do it on a piece of paper. They can do it on the back of an envelope. They can do it in their head if they're really good at math. Um, and it turned out that because of that computational technique that we used, that single integer worked as well as the fancy math model. And what this picture says, you want it to have a nice straight line from the left to the right, so good calibration between what is now called the Phoenix sepsis score and in-hospital mortality. These are data from high resource uh, environments, and it has that nice shape. So as the score goes up, mortality risk goes up. It has that nice shape in lower resource environments also. So then we went back to the task force and said, okay, we have this new score, it works. Um, we need to pick a point and say, this is sepsis and this isn't. So we had to pick a threshold on that score. We again presented some machine learning results to them and worked with people and said, okay, what is gonna work in all of the environments where we need to take care of kids with sepsis? What thresholds should we pick? We identified two points on that Phoenix sepsis score as the best balance of sensitivity and specificity. And to identify septic shock, as two points with at least one being a cardiovascular point. So then um, this figure basically shows that that threshold, that two point threshold works much better than that definition um, uh, built in 2005, a bunch of people in a room. And in comparison with the, with the adult definition, um, we use the same uh, sort of conceptual framework, a bunch of electronic health record data, but our data was larger, more diverse from, from places with a lot lower resources. And we, I think we got better results because we broke things down into smaller pieces and then used machine learning to put them back together to echo some of the, the earlier speakers. Um, so we released these criteria in late January uh, of this year in a couple of papers in JAMA. Um, and already the, uh, the main criteria paper has been looked at as of when I made these slides last week, 110,000 times. And the other paper has been looked at 37,000 times. Uh, we know that um, already in this country, a number of different institutions are deploying these new criteria in their electronic health records. We did this in order to save lives and to improve the lives of those who do survive. And we believe that this is one way that it's actually gonna happen. My team has already built a mobile application for use um, to generate this score and, and these criteria in low resource environments anywhere in the world. We're working in collaboration with a group that's done a lot of work um, with mobile applications in Africa. And in addition, um, I just spent seven days working in the ICU and I use it every day. So this is having real impact now. It was released in January. So, I'm very, very proud that this was NIH funded, but it was locally made. So Children's Colorado was one of the sites. We computed this on the computational environment in the Google Cloud that is a part of Health Data Compass. My uh, core data science team did a large body of work, and there are other CU faculty that made really important contributions. So uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. DeCamp to talk about the ethical considerations of this. Well, great. Well, thank you, and thank you all for coming this evening and joining us to learn more about AI. I'm a practicing internist. I'm also a philosopher. I work at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, where we do multidisciplinary research using social sciences, history, law, philosophy, and more to address cutting-edge problems at that intersection of healthcare and bioethics. And tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about an ethics perspective on AI. This is my dad. We lost my dad last year to leukemia, and as anyone who's lost a loved one knows, afterwards, you often think about the memories of that person. And one of the memories I have of my dad is he always liked witty sayings and aphorisms. Here's one of his favorites. When all is said and done, more is said than done. <laughs> but tonight I want to talk about a different one of his witty sayings and explain how I think it can help us understand ethics of AI and healthcare. Here's the saying, you gotta have the right tool for the job. Now we, we wanna start with the last word in this sentence, with the job, because my dad didn't endorse the 1964 law of the instrument, which you've already heard from Dr. Lynn this evening, Kaplan's 1964 law, which you might be familiar with, says give a small boy a hammer and he will find that everything he encounters needs pounding. My dad didn't start with the tool and look for a job. He started with the job or the need, and he looked for the tool 
to meet that particular need. What does this mean in healthcare? What is the need or the job of healthcare? Well, I think our North Star, so to speak, from the standpoint of a primary care physician, is patient centered, high quality, equitable care delivered through caring relationships. And I think if we keep this North Star in mind, it can help us as we think through some of the challenges of using AI in practice. So for example, I think this North Star can help us avoid what I call technology's temptation. It can help us ensure that we prioritize using electronic health records for their primary purposes of caring and communication, not for commodifying data. Or more provocatively, here is B Jeremy Bentham's 18th century panopticon, an ideal prison designed in circular fashion for 360 degree and constant observation. If we keep our North Star in mind, we can ensure that healthcare spaces remain sites of healing, not a means for better surveillance, as has actually been done in hospital settings for hand washing and otherwise. So this brings us to the first lesson I want to offer about ethics and AI in healthcare. We want to focus on the job of patient care and not ask only whether we can, but whether we should. And this is a foundational first starting question of ethics. But ethics is about more than just that. Like a refiner's fire, ethics should also be able to help us modify our tools, refine our tools to do a better job. And we could talk about a lot of ethics issues in AI, and they all matter. All these ethics issues on this screen matter because they affect that summative concept of healthcare, which is trust in healthcare, health institutions, health professionals. Without trust, all is lost. We could talk about each of these, but tonight I'm just going to focus on three. The idea of transparency, the idea of choice, and the idea of equity or bias in AI. So when it comes to transparency, let me introduce you to Livy, the UC Health virtual assistant or chatbot. We're so fortunate on our team to work with Matt Andazola and the rest of his team at UC Health with this real world patient facing chatbot. In the middle here, you can see a slight conversation that I had with Livy on my own mobile phone. Livy says, hi, Matt. I ask Livy about doing my advanced directive. Livy responds, and then Livy ends up taking me through the process of a medical power of attorney form all online. Now, I didn't share much with Livy here, not much information, but isn't it interesting to know that in some settings, people share more with chatbots like Livy than they do real people because chatbots aren't judgy like real people are. And so there's actually more sharing. Tools like Livy have great potential. When they're accessible by things like your mobile phone and linked to your electronic health record, these patient-facing chatbots can de deliver personalized care, recommendations, guidelines, and so much more, even breaking down geographic barriers to care, which we know all so well in the state of Colorado for rural communities. But let's ask one of these fundamental questions of transparency. Do patients know Livy is a computer? We've done surveys of more than 600 patients asking them if they knew what Livy was when they were interacting with her, if we can use the pronoun her, that is. And in fact, one in three weren't sure or thought that Livy was a real person typing back to them. And what's more, correctly identifying Livy correlated with race, ethnicity, and education but not age, income, or gender. So an interesting issue of transparency here with Livy. But the issues go deeper. We didn't just survey some 600 patients, we actually interviewed dozens about their experience with Livy, and we sometimes heard things like this. Because I'm a person of color, thinking a little bit of the basic hair design, because again, I think it just gives it a little bit more of a connection to minorities and our health. And this patient's right. In the phenomenon known as mirroring, if we mirror the appearance of the chatbot to the person, it can actually be more effective at motivating behavior change, following up on that colonoscopy reminder, following up on that mammogram reminder. But we have to ask the ethics question. Can we design chatbots to achieve these benefits without crossing some line, some ethical line into manipulation? 
Now, if you put these two things together, this idea of transparency and this idea of choice, we find ourselves in a bit of an ethics balancing act. Making AI ever more human seems to make them more effective and more enjoyable for patients when they use them. But on the other hand, making AI ever more human risks that concept of transparency and risks the notion of misidentification. So lesson number two, we can acknowledge that transparency comes in degrees, but we ought to err on the side of more, but not less. I want to shift gears and talk about something you've already heard about this evening, and that's the idea of AI-based predictions or prognostic tools. AI can predict all sorts of things, cats and dogs and so on. But what do you think about the idea of an AI crystal ball that can predict your death with shocking accuracy up to four years from now? This is a highlight of a study like that. Is this the job of healthcare, we would ask from the standpoint of ethics? Maybe, and we at CU are leaders in the field of palliative care, and it's certainly possible that AI-based mortality prediction could help us make better end-of-life decisions, reduce barriers to access to palliative care, avoid unwanted hospitalizations, and so much more, but only if it's done well. Now, you can imagine there are lots of ethics issues around a technology like this one, but tonight I'm only going to focus on one, and that's this concept of equity or bias. In ethics, we think of bias really generally as any systematic, unfair weighting of a person, a thing, or an idea. And if you look closely at these mortality prediction models, use a magnifying glass, you'll sometimes see sentences like this one. The algorithm has shown high accuracy. The overall accuracy is reduced in certain subgroups, such as racial and ethnic minorities, and less educated individuals. Hmm. Now, why would that be? Why would a particular model that performs well in one circumstance not perform well in another circumstance, as an example of bias, which you've already heard a little bit about? I see bias as coming from three sources. First, there are biased data sets. Some people are overrepresented in our clinical data sets and our trial data because of who has access to and who can participate in research. Not all the data sets are as good as Dr. Bennett's at achieving racial and ethnic diversity in data sets, and that can create a bias. Second, teams can make flawed assumptions. For example, you could assume that healthcare cost equals healthcare need, but that's not true in a society where some money is spent, more money is spent on some patients versus others, not according to health status, but due to social and structural factors. There are going to be biased assumptions in the processing of the model. And lastly, our biased use. Imagine a clinician who decides to use the AI for this patient, but not that patient, perhaps due to implicit or explicit biases. All three of these together can create issues of bias and inequity when we apply AI in healthcare. But don't take my word for it. A picture is worth a thousand words. So I want to give you a minute to look at this image, which was generated by AI, some of the AI technologies you've heard about already this evening. Now let's read the prompt together. Traditional African healer is helping poor and sick white children. Shocking, isn't it? It's as if this AI cannot conceive of anything other than this. And so now you see a visual illustration of the way AI and generative AI can reflect biases and even perpetuate things like misinformation. Now I'm interested in this topic in the real world. How do clinicians, how do healthcare professionals wrestle with this idea of biased models? Would they use a biased model? And so in research we've conducted with physicians, patients, and families across four major U.S. medical centers, we'll sometimes hear things like, using a biased algorithm is okay. There's still value in using an algorithm like that. We use something similar for cardiovascular disease. We know it's more accurate for certain swaths. But we also hear using biased algorithms is not okay. That's such a slippery slope. It just means that it's okay to have inequities because it's a little bit better for everyone. Now, this is a really complicated space, but we hope to learn a lot more later this year because we currently have a nationwide physician survey collecting data in the field on this and many other questions. Thankfully, there are strategies for addressing bias in AI. When it comes to biased data sets, we can engage communities as partners so they want to contribute data to science as our community engagement 
and Health Equity Corps is doing as part of the Translational Sciences Institute. We can create diverse teams that are less likely to make some of those biased assumptions as I and my colleagues, Drs. Yang and Flores, are doing with an NIH-funded training program. And lastly, we can reckon with the social and structural inequities that occur, as I would say, when even a fair algorithm enters an unfair world, as we certainly hope the Center for Health Equity, the new Center for Health Equity, will do. Now, notice something about these three solutions. They aren't, strictly speaking, just about the data. They're more about society. And that brings us to our next lesson, which is that fixing bias in AI is not just a data problem. It's actually a social problem. I want to close with a couple general bigger picture comments. We like to call AI tools. I've used tool throughout my presentation this evening. But sociological research reminds us that whether it's the computer, the written language, the number, the automobile, or more, the tools we use don't just change what we do. Unchecked, they change who we are, what we value. And it's important to remember this about tools. It's up to us be sh to be sure it's for the better. Let me make this concrete. Let's go back to those smart replies Dr. Lin mentioned earlier that mediate between a patient and a healthcare professional in the electronic health record. Here's an interesting and I think provocative study. In one study, perceived use of these smart replies caused the recipient, who could be a patient, to review the sender, who could be a physician, more negatively. But actual use, unbeknownst to the individual, caused the recipient, who could be a patient, to review the sender, who could be a phys physician, more positively. Now we think back to transparency, and we're in a bit of an ethical quagmire. It seems like smart replies can help those caring relationships we care about, but only if patients don't know it. Now, you might think I'm a pessimist, but I don't want to end with pessimism. I want to instead offer a little bit of a reassurance from history. 200 years ago, medicine wrote of a new technology, doubting that it could be used. It required too much time. It was a good deal of trouble, and it was even foreign to our intuitions by placing far too much distance between patients and physicians. And yet we came to accept this technology, the stethoscope. <laughs> Lesson four, AI is not merely a tool, and we have the power to choose which path we take when we implement and use these technologies. Remember my dad. You gotta have the right tool for the job. We start with the job, we use ethics to refine the tool, and together we can transform healthcare. Thanks for your time, thanks to my amazing team for helping make this possible. And now we have a transition to a very special event. Thanks. No, I don't need it. How many of you may have heard me sing before? And for those of you, I'm sorry. Um, uh, in my job as electronic health records guru, um, I find that sometimes humor gets the message through a little bit better than just long-winded lectures. And I ended up a few years ago starting to write electronic health record parody songs based on popular tunes to illustrate my point. And so for you tonight, if we can go on to the next slide. Can you make this larger on my display here? Yes. Um, anybody know Taylor Swift? <laughs> uh, having recently become a Swifty myself, um, I wrote an electronic hair clerical parody song to the song Blank Space by, uh, by Taylor Swift. Um, and the funny backstory is that this is not my song. This is Casey Green uh, saying, hey, CT, we ought to have a generative AI song. And I'm like, oh, really? Got to make another one? He said, no, no, I already started one for you with my best friend, ChatGPT. 
And so he had actually, I, I love the, and I actually have this on my blog, if you, if you want to go and read my blog, ctlin.blog, there's an episode where I talk about Casey's journey, where as he says, hey, can you take this stanza from Blank Space, from Taylor, Taylor Swift's song, and explain what it means to me? And says, yes, certainly, this is a woman who da 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 and he says, well, we're fine, let's replace that with a doctor who's not sure that he wants to play ball with uh, generative AI. What would that stanza sound like? Sure, here's a stanza version for you. And then over time, you see him working it into a better and better spot. And he handed it over to me and says, here's a song for you. And I thought, well, I could place some sepsis-specific references in here. And this is the song you have tonight. Nice to meet you. What's your code? Data streaming in shiny rows. Logic, learning, sepsis risk. Saw your specs and I thought you might catch just one more case Or you could be my next mistake Predictions hard, what's your take? Algorithmic bias in the AI Signal to noise is tough to spy Hidden dangers with DEI Workflow hiccups for you and I So hey, let's collaborate I'll, I'm eager to see what we'll create Grab your blueprints, take my hand we can make the old ways better in a weekend. So I test your sensitivity, and I feel like it's gonna work out. Now I check your specificity, and I worry and I'm full of doubt. Here's a long list of false positives. You shrug and give a smirk, cause you're a black box, baby, and I'll check your work. So it's gonna be forever. Or it's gonna fail and fade You can tell me when it's over If your the leap was worth the upgrade Got a long list of successes These are the lives we've saved So I've got a blank space, baby And I'll write your name All right, now is our uh, opportunity to do Q&A with our speakers, and uh, we'll start that in a second after the chairs get put on top. All right, so who has the first question? Raise your hand if you, please raise your hand if you have a question. All right. And we have mics working their way around the room. So in talking about the sepsis prediction, um, there was just discussion of needing to have RNs and doctors look at data to see actually this is a, this is a true sepsis case and tweak that score and make it useful. Um, and it turned out that you needed that sort of virtual health center to really make it worthwhile. What would it take to get an algorithm to be able to do that same thing? My, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, but uh, th this is early days, I think, for our predictive models and for generative AI. A true self-learning model would be able to adjust the parameters as you go. But because of the risk of black boxes, right? We, we all as clinicians want to be able to explain, well, I took this action because here's my reasons why. And we go to the AI and you say, well, why'd you say that? And half the time says, because I, that's the math I did. And you're like, well, that's not good enough. And that gets worse when you give it sort of self-learning ability to say, well, keep adjusting yourself to get better. And how can you prove that today's better than yesterday? Well, you should just trust me. That's not good enough. And so for us to be able to improve the algorithm day over day, month over month, we have to really take things apart and go, is, true, you know, is version two better than version one? Do we trust it? And that's, that's, a, that's an issue. So yes, in the, fundamentally in the long run, we do want these tools to improve. We don't want to sit here at 30 to one signal to noise. That's a terrible way to invest humans to sit down and try to sort things out. But that's the state of the art today. And, and I think over time, yes, let's get our mathematicians working on better iterative tools. And I, you know, I might ask, does something like the virtual health center position us to 
lead in that space? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So interviewing our nurses and doctors, like, what are you looking at that makes your prediction better than what the AI does? And so these are, these are all the ongoing efforts that we have now. I might, just, just to add to that, you, you mentioned the notion of black box, and I think one of the things we also struggle with ethically and in, and in AI is comparisons to the status quo and whether we hold AI to standards that we don't actually hold the rest of medicine to when a lot of the rest of medicine is a black box. We don't like to talk about that, but I think from the standpoint of ethics, we have these difficult comparisons about well, what is the status quo, how do we evaluate new technologies against it, and how do we weigh these different trade-offs that are being made. I, I, would, I would echo that because sometimes when you walk up to an experienced ICU clinician and you go, well, why did you get the lactate on this person? It doesn't look like, it doesn't feel right to me, right? Well, that's a black box too because you've decades of experience and you can't necessarily say it's because of this reason. It just, I walked in and it didn't feel right, therefore. And it turns out you were right. Um, that's clinical judgment. No, no, that's a black box if you label it from, a, from an AI, right? So how do you, how do you, when, when is it okay to do something like that? That is exactly the, the motivating problem for what you're asking because those experienced clinicians are not available in every environment all the time. And so how do we extend their reach and impact with computational tools? We have another question back here. Hi, I have a, a question, can, if you can hear me. Um, my understanding is that generative AI works by um, taking what people learn from all over the place and pull it together and somehow, you know, come up with, with, um, with, with various different programs or, and I, I know in like in the legal field, we're concerned because um, if we use generative AI, generative AI in, our, uh, in our work and it pulls terms of contracts from other, other companies or other databases, all of a sudden we have issues of, um, uh, you know, property, uh, intellectual property ownership, things like that. So in terms of what you're learning and what you're doing with what you're developing, um, what are your concerns like for UC Health or, or is our, our medical places and research organizations sort of collaborating on what's being learned? Does, does anyone want to jump? I'm happy to Go ahead. start. But um, yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that uh, our campus has been very careful about um, is, um, you know, providing avenues for folks to use these tools in ways that are responsible and that don't leak data. Um, and so, I think that's a key part to being able to to use it is having the right guidance of, you know, this tool is suitable for data that is sort of this that for which this regulation applies. Um, and so I think. You know, I, I um, ended up speaking to our uh, information strategy and services group, and um, you know, one of the things I was really impressed by in academia, I think sometimes there's a push of like, okay, we just need to like shut it all down right now and then figure it out and then we can turn it on. And um, you know, here, I, one of the things that impressed me was the attitude was, okay, these tools will be widespread. It is going to happen. So let's figure out how we do it responsibly and then let's give people guidance of how to use these tools responsibly. Um, you know, for the patient messages uh, and IP related to, you know, whether something is synthesized as a patient message that looks similar to what's written before, I'd have to turn that to CT. I think the foundation of your question is right on and, and the short answer is we don't know what we don't know yet. Right, so many of these AI models were trained on the entire internet up until 2021. Well, are there proprietary data sets that it sucked up in there? And are we using someone's intellectual property? And I know that Europe and, and various other governments are, are looking at, is it suit lawsuits to say, you, you need to take this stuff out. You know, you re need to retrain the model and explicitly remove things that you found on the internet just because you could get there. I, I think this is going to evolve the next few years um, and we don't know where we're gonna end up. Um, we do know from our side about leaking our intellectual property out that there are so many free tools, right? All of you can go on Google or, or Microsoft uh, Edge and, and chat with Copilot. And if you're using the free tool, guess what? Everything you put in there is going straight to Microsoft or Google and they're all incorporated in whatever they want to do with it. And so we're being very careful with our clinicians to say we have an internal generative AI policy. 
which is if you're not using a tool we purchased for explicit internal use, you're basically giving the stuff away. And don't you dare put any patient information in there and say, hey, I wonder if you could do a summary of this conversation. And we're like, no, no, this is private information that we keep very closely guarded here for benefit of our patients. So there are some soft, uh, just because these tools are so widely available, we have lots of mis opportunities to misbehave in ways that if you're not careful, we can cross that line very easily. And your question also made me think about privacy and what patients think about privacy. And in, in our study with Livy, the chatbot, we've been a little bit surprised, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, but people who use Livy, uh, number one, actually start to think that the information they put into the chatbot comes to me also as their physician, like it's somehow in a record that I can review and they're okay with that. Um, they also aren't very worried about their privacy that, of the data they, and what they talk to Livy about. But in part, that's because, again, the importance of this foundational trust. That comes from trust in the healthcare system and trust in healthcare privacy regulations and so on. And that's the kind of trust that we certainly can't risk abusing by doing something wrong. I thought the um, <clears throat> information you gave us on the diagnostic power of the retinal scan was fascinating. And I think for some of us in this room, it would take us back to the 1960s and 70s when Star Trek was uh, playing with the uh, tricorder that would wave across the body. And, and I thought of that kind of scan where you can tell what's wrong with this person and what can we do to save her, him. Um, any thoughts on something like that? Are we moving in that direction with the retinal scan and beyond? I, I think there's an opportunity to do a lot with the retinal scan. Uh, are, we, are we getting to the tricorder? I'm not quite sure yet. <laughs> but but I, I do think, besides looking at your eye and saying if you have AMD or glaucoma or all of the th diseases of the eye, it really can tell you a lot about your card cardiovascular risk, your neurological risk. So I think we are just at the sort of the tip of that iceberg in terms of what we can do. Uh, and the reason why the eye is such a powerful window is use the same vasculature that's in your eye, is in your brain, it's in your heart. So we have signals in the eye that are a, a, an easy, non-invasive way of getting at what's happening in the body. And so I think I, the, the published literature has been absolutely amazing in how well it works. Uh, and our own work is showing it, the signal is there. Uh, the questions of bias, will it work just as well in a dark-skinned a uh, darkly pigmented fundus as it would in a uh, uh, lighter fundus, or does it work for all subpopulations? All of those things continue to um, have to be answered, but we are just at the, at the very exciting tip. The last two years is where we've seen so much work. Mm. One more question? Last question? Time for one, one more, more question. question. I'm the last one. Um, <laughs> once more about the eye. Um, how, how early can you predict a disease uh, from what you see in the eye? So uh, for certain things like, uh, th those recently published work for both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's suggesting even as early as three to five years before an official diagnosis uh, for heart disease similarly. So we don't know exactly how early we can get. It's hard to get the data we need to sort of really validate that. But the, the indications are certainly a few, somewhere between three to five years for sure and maybe even more. So we, again, I, Everything we say today maybe uh, sort of will change tomorrow. The technology is changing so quickly. It, it's absolutely amazing how quickly the technology is changing. So I, we anticipate that if he asked us this next year, we'll have a diff different answer. But I think, uh, yeah. We want to be respectful of your time. One of the great parts about my job is whenever I go into a meeting with faculty, I can be absolutely certain that I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Please help me thank our panel. Mm -hmm.